Hello, Ari out there. It's Mark, and we're back to Redo Overs Ga Galactic Civilizations 4, Episode 5, I think. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So, we're picking up where we left off. We just discovered the planetology research, got unlocked, and I saved the game, and then it popped up this screen. So, yeah, it's a little asynchronous, I think, on some of these events that occur. But here we are. We met a Xeno. Situation report. Incoming message from the Torian regime. A small bipedal appears on screen, staring at us. It has a wide, flat skull, large eyes, which seem to avoid making eye contact with us. Perhaps a side effect of the communication system? It murmurs at us for a time in a language devoid of sharp, consonant sounds. But no meaning really comes through. We'll have to converse with this strange creature another time. You need to research universal translator technology. So we say, huh? What? Or fake smile and nod as if you understand, then proceed to close the incoming message. Yeah, there we go. That's a... <laughs> they don't know. So up here, you'll notice we do not have a research. We're researching because we just finished up planetology. So, oh my gosh, that pops up every time. Real quick, we'll grab our next research, then we'll jump into the technology library and review planetology. So... At this point, oh, there's some expensive options. Look at that, Xenobiology rocking in at 17 turns. Holy cows. Orbital factories could get us a starport, some mining missions. Now, nah. let's go with the research district. Technological capital, that should be a building option. Upgrade our research buildings, orbital research lab, and a new policy research grants. Sweet, let's check that. So, research districts, there we go, it's selected. And let's jump to the technology tree. And we were looking for planetology just completed. So check this out. Under the research library, not tree, technology library, we can filter by all the different categories. So engineering, warfare, governance. Those are the four big ones. And then there are common, rare, uncommon. They don't seem to have anything in those i've never seen any technology pop up so maybe there's something i'm not quite understanding about that possibly or they haven't implemented that yet in the game or they're depreciating it in the game and just haven't gotten rid of the buttons yet question <laughs> so yeah we'll jump over and you'll notice here it'll tell us complete for the ones we've completed and i think in general these are sorted currently by cost meaning how many beakers does it take to research the technology you can see it slowly progresses over time and occasionally some of them will share so like 97 97 99 99 um so it looks like it advances by twos occasionally but here you see that's a 105 that's a 107 so you get pretty discreet on the research ranges i don't know why that is maybe they're dynamically generated with each game a little bit a little wiggle room I only question that because maybe hydroponics is not always 100 research beakers for a game. Question? I don't know. Probably doesn't matter. But And then let's just scoot down to the very bottom. You can see here's a, a capstone genetic architecture coming in at 483. That's way, way down the technology uh, library tree. Or it's, or it's way to the, the right. The, no, yeah, the no. There, that way, <laughs> on the technology tree. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and I know some of the technologies and can go well into the thousands of research, I believe. Here, let's scroll down to engineering. There we go. Manufacturing stimulus, 2,729. Uh, it's behind my face box. You can't see it. Well, here's this one. Galactic resupply doctrine, 2,707. So that's your scale there for how high these bad boys can go. No big deal, but ultimately we came in here because we wanted to look at planetology. What that gave us was allows us to house more people on our worlds. We unlocked the Kimberly's Refuge building and the housing district improvement, not a building. And it leads to xenobiology. So let's quick, I'll hold the shift key. I'll mouse over Kimberly's Refuge. So food improvement. Professor Taylor's Uganda is growing techniques produce food on an alien world. It's a galactic achievement, meaning that we want to get this before any other civilization 
because this building can only be built once in our galaxy. Cannot be built on a desert or mountain area. Not that I think that really matters. I mean, you'll, you'll have plenty of places to build it. And I see here, that looks like an influence is symbol next to the mountain symbol. So an influence mountain? I, I don't know. That's that's very obscure, and, and I have no good explanation for what that means. But ultimately, the production cost is coming in at 150. It's not that bad. But what's rare about it is this Monsantium deposit. It takes one, and we don't have one. Most Xenos at this early stage of the game probably don't have access to that, if I had to guess. The base effect, though, will be a, just a flat plus five, five, plus five to our food and food growth plus 25. Now, what I'm not sure about with Galactic Achievements is if this effect is only on the planet or because it's a Galactic, galactic Achievement, it's a plus 25 everywhere in, in our civilization. I think it's just on the planet. I... Um, We'll look. Well, like if we can build the Kimberly's Refuge, what we could do is then go into the food production on each of our colonies and go into the breakdown and see if it shows Kimberly's Refuge is providing a plus 25% and we could answer that question. So if I remember to, we'll look into it. But other than that, the bonus per level is simply uh, every level that that building goes up from adjacent hexes, giving it, you know, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, we'll give one additional food on top of the base. And, um... Anything else there? Adjacency level bonus is a plus three level to population. So wherever we put plump down Kimberly's Refuge, all the adjacent hexes would provide a plus three to population buildings. That's how that works. So that would really, more than anything, make all the population buildings around it much better. So that's cool. And then for housing districts, this is just a basic improvement. So rather than what this does is it upgrades all the hexes we've already built the population improvement on. And it shows up essentially as a, as a plus square uh, under your building selections. You'll see, do you want to improve production? Do you want to improve research? Do you want to improve buildings, uh, population, housing? And you can hit plus. And, and you can go from level 1 to level 2 to level 3 to level 4. And ultimately, that will give all the hexes on the, so, so say you built a world that was very heavy into research. You had all your hexes developed to research, like 90% of them. There's like 18 hexes that are developed for research. By hitting your improved research one time and paying that flat fee, you improve all 18. Their level goes up by one. So ultimately, it gives you way less effect to get those general district improvements, research district, production district, housing district, food districts, if you built a handful of every type of district on a given colony, then you're getting way less back per improvement. It's not a, that big of a deal. You, you can just have diversified colonies. But if you specialize a colony, it gives you a very cheap way to improve a lot of hexes at once. So focusing colonies in on given specialization maybe isn't the best early game tactic, but as your game advances and you've got a dozen colonies, you can you can play around with it or eight colonies, you might take some and say, you're the research, you're the food, you're the influence, you're the production, and, and really start magnifying, a mic micro-focusing that way. But that's it. That's what we got there for Planetology. So uh, we can hit back and we'll hit done. So we've backed out of there and then we'll quickly dip into our single colony earth double click say done now over here in this area is where i would see the housing district upgrade but because we have not made any housing improvements yet we don't see that option it's not even an option because there's nothing to improve however if you mouse up here you'll see here's kimberly's refuge it is grayed out or darkened you can see we take 33 turns to build, and of course we are lacking that Monsantium deposit. I think uh, Monsantium is, well, I get the impression it's sort of a biology-based, um, maybe relates to mountains? <laughs> maybe it's a play on Mon Monsantos, the, the massive food corporation on Earth? I don't know. Um, yeah, at any rate, we're good to go. We have plenty of the production queue, so we'll back out of there. So, we have Reviewed our research, we've met the Torian, the, the turtle, turtle people. 
And uh, is there anything else we can do? No, our dang colony ship is still, still heading over. Still one turn out. My lord, we're going to hit advance our turn. Tell you what we could do real quick. You can see that it's advancing. We've got an event popped up. Um, gosh dang it, my face box. Hold on, hold on. I always put this dang thing over here just to kind of get it out of the way. But I figure it's useful for you guys to see that the, the little exclamation is an event is, is occurred. So yeah, there you go. But um, I want to go to policies real quick. Let's jump to our civilization tab. Only so that we can review the... Eh, we didn't get it. Oh, we we we, uh, sorry, we we will learn the research policy genius grant once our next research is completed. So I'm jumping the gun here. There's nothing to look at just yet. So we'll look at our event. Here we go. Situation report, a way to communicate. We've encountered the Torians. As of yet, we've been unable to communicate with them. But our scientists claim that they can develop universal translation technology if they're given time and resources. What are your orders? So we'll assign our scientists a task when we have time meaning we'll just naturally get to it when we get to it via the research uh, tree. Or we could contract a private corporation to do the work. So we wait 10 months and it costs us 600 out of the treasury and we get that technology. It's not a bad option because it's essentially, it's not often in the game you get to buy a technology, but that really is what you're talking about. We can keep our research going on other categories taking four or five six turns months to get them and get a couple and in the same time we can in parallel be working on this i've never done it before so let's just try it let's burn the 600 i can see our our piggy bank sits in at 1278 right now let's do it boom there we go now you can see our research topic is still the research districts and that is going in the background now this popped up over here in the upper left corner. You see this little, uh, we'll call it a project or a, a, a quest, whatever. So yeah, way to communicate. I click it and it opens this up, way to communicate. So we've discovered the aliens in the universe, but we have no way to communicate with them. Rather than pull our scientists from the other work, we have offered a substantial reward to any private corporation that can provide the technology. So the reward is universal translator technology. And it says, wait 10 turns, we're zero of 10. And that's it. So everything else just progresses. We don't have to do anything else. We'll just get it. And I think that's probably a wise use of 600 credits at this early stage of the game. Yeah, what the heck. So let's advance our turn. And our colony ship reached the new planet. Kratos 4. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable name. I, I think that sounds awesome. With the establishment of this colony, we've taken our first steps into the galaxy. Our colonists represent everything which makes our people great. And with that, they have every chance of thriving on this new alien world. And you can see the beautiful colony ship detaching the geodesic domes, uh, drop ships. And each one of these will be an enclosed habitat on the new world, providing obviously pressure, atmosphere, radiation shielding, temperature control, all that, that we need. Uh, probably not artificial gravity, because I don't think we've got that yet. But yeah, you get my point. And they'll sprinkle those around various viable places on the planet. So we won't see that graphic again. Just the first time you colonize in each game, you get to see that cool little cinematic, which I like. Kratos 4 Planet Report. Here we go. Two giant precursor structures orbit the poles of Kratos 4. They seem to have been used to somehow terraform a Promethean gas giant into a habitable world. So Kratos very possibly was at one point had a massively dense and thick atmosphere that they either condensed down to the surface or stripped away. Interesting. We're able to use the Promethean stored in them to increase the range of any ships built by our shipyard on this planet specifically. Our scientists think they can do more with these giant machines and would like your permission to study them further. What are your orders? Now, this is important. Um, I don't know that every new colony gives you this option, but many do. And this is a permanent modification to this planet. We probably won't be able to undo what we choose here, so we do have to be careful. See if they can find a way to terraform the surface. It's plus two usable tiles. So we already knew this was an amazing world. 
come in at what, like a amazing 24 or amazing class 26. I don't exactly remember, but we can upgrade this by two right now, pushing it from a 24 to a 26 or a 26 to 28, whatever it is, just two more tiles. That's not a bad thing. That That's a big get. That's actually pretty big. Option two, see if there's any way to boost the value of the land we have now. Plus one improvement level. What? I don't think I've seen this one before, and I'm not exactly clear what they're, what they're implying here. But as you know, all the tiles, some of them have, uh, have very special icons we talked about back in like episode two or whatever. Some of them have basic little black and white basic icons, which is just represents a plus one. And some of them have no icon of any sort. They're just a mountain or a desert or an ocean. They don't have any special ability. Now, is this saying that one of the hexes on this world will get a plus one improvement level? One of the blank tiles is just a desert will become a food producing desert. I, I, I don't know. Maybe? Or do all tiles get a plus one improvement? There's a big difference. Because if that's the case, this would be like an insanely good planet. So the, the trade-off I'm seeing so far is you want just two random, probably blank tiles. Just, just basic generic land tiles with no specialness about them. You could just build a building there or whatever. To me, that seems really good. Or they're saying you just want to use keep the hexes you have, but you get a plus one improvement on one of those hexes. I think the plus two hexes are better than a plus one improvement. However, if I'm wrong and the plus one improvement is across all tiles, I've never seen that. I almost don't, I almost think it's too good to be true, but I don't know. Third option, see what you could do to sh shut the complainers up. We have a galaxy to conquer. Uh, that just gives us plus 10 control one time. I, I, I know that's just a one time plus 10 to control. And again, we, we don't need that. So we definitely want you that. I think for the sake of us all learning together, we know with certainty that the top option will give us plus two usable tiles. There's no question of that. And it's a very good choice. I'd highly recommend it. However, for the sake of us all learning together, I think we're going to go with option two and see if, what that plus one improvement level means. Probably not going to get it everywhere. We'll know. I mean, if we open up the world and it's got everything, we'll be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's, oh. But I don't think that's going to happen. It'll probably just mean one of those tiles gets a little black and white and we'll, we won't even know which one it is. But I'm going to take the risk just to find out. So here we go. I'm going to take the risk so you don't have to worry about the, the harm that can come from playing the game and being disappointed. You hear the music? It's not really dance music. It's like all hunter music it's pretty scary it's pretty intimidating because this is the your incoming message from the your singularity it's an ai singularity a metallic creature appears on screen unblinking red sensors staring back at us the sensor iris opens a bit before narrowing the creatures studying us sounds emerge from it a clash of discordant sounds almost as if it's trying to differ different languages on us to see if we understand anything we don't the sensors narrow even further there's no point communicating with this being now. You need to research a universal translator. Uh, yeah, no shit. Um, so we'll just say, huh? <laughs> None of those matter. That's just, yeah. Until you get universal translator, you cannot communicate with any other species. Now there are two types of humans. There's like a diaspora style human or something like that. I question if you played the regular Terrans and then met the Diaspora Terrans, if they could communicate with the same language. I don't know. That would be a nice that would be a nice touch, but I don't think so. I don't think you can have any Xeno communication till you get the Universal Translator. Simple enough. Now, the turns advance through. You'll notice that Kratos IV is now has its own sphere of influence that will expand uh, grow over time. And eventually, theoretically, these two bubbles will merge and we'll get one nice large civilization going. But I see some really good stuff over here, by the way. We do have more Durantium. We're going to want to mine that. If I remember, 
Oh gosh, we have Durantium here. We need to get some space stations built. I think we might, we'll take care of that this episode. We're going to get a space station built for this Durantium here. Enormously strong and pliable. Durantium is required for most orbital improvements. Yeah, you need a lot of Durantium in any game you play. Some of the strategic resources are very rare. You, you might not need them at all, or if you need them, you might only need like three of them ever. But Durantium's not one of those. You got to go for the Durantium. So I see that there. I see another Durantium here. I see an A-mat right here. That's the little star shape. Um, I see a Prometheum here, which is the orange lines. And uh, Illyrium in this cloud. Yes, very often this little blue Illyrium will appear in Nebula. Almost always. So yeah, there's we're going to definitely get on those space stations. So let's just jump real quickly into our forge. I'm going to double click. And we have the colony ship. Constructor is next in the queue. Constructor will build the space station. So we'll get to that. And of course, the Stargazer is going to get done. Now, knowing that each space station's harvesting range is five hexes, we'll need one star base around this Durantium. Probably we would need one for the AMAT. We'd need one for the Illyrium and one over here. Occasionally, you might find two strategic resources close enough together that a single star base can harvest both. And those are strategically much more valuable than a, than a standalone resource because you, you get twice the production from one star base. That's obvious. Um, something you'd chase after. A little strategy involved there. But um, And we also found this yellow object. This is an economic relic. Economic relics increase colony gross income. Essentially, this is um, it's a type of anomaly, I would say. I mean, it's a, it's a relic. It's permanent. So... When you you harvest it, actually, by building a star base near it, you put a Xeno Archaeology module on the star base, and you will start to get a little bit of economic bonus from it. Now, interestingly, in this case, we can see that the Durantium is actually quite close to the economic relic. So this is a strategic point. We would send our first constructor and we would send it and build our star base right here between these two. And then we'll be able to mine the Durantium and the Xeno Archaeology module that will build onto that, that will add onto that star base when we have the, the funds to do it. We'll harvest that economic bonus. So you'll see that we'll try and get to that today for sure. Um, what else do we have here? We got um, some asteroids. We might mine those eventually, sending the resources to Kratos. We also have a couple of low-class planets. Uh, Kratos 3 is a class 2 poor, but yeah, we take it. Um, Kratos 1 is dead. Kratos 2 is a class 22 amazing. Oh, it's plus 5 on um, industry. Is it, uh, is it not going to open that up? Uh, minerals. Plus 4 on technology. Plus 4 on wealth. Plus 4 on food. And a plus 1 on cultural significance. Is it inputs to influence that's a good world we want that now we can get another colony ship sent to kratos 2 we should do that quickly that would then feed into kratos 4 potentially and then those feed back well right now you see this little dotted line pulsing away from kratos 4 in the direction of earth right now kratos 4 is a colony only not a core world can we convert kratos Four into a core world. Yeah, and we probably should. Again, her class is 25 amazing. It's a good planet. If I double click on Kratos, though, it won't open up a world window like with Earth. If I double click on Earth, we get this. We get Earth with all the wonderfully misshapen continents back out of there. But when I double click on Kratos, nothing happens. The only way we can get into Kratos and develop it is by making it a core world. We will do that now by assigning a leader's governor. So we're going to jump down to our leaders tab here. And we don't have any unassigned leaders over here. This is blank. So we need to hire one. Fortunately, we still have 600 plus income. So we can we can buy one, sign a contract. What do we have here? Anyone who looks exceptional? No one's exceptional. Um, remember, we're interested in the blue, the green, and the purple for a governor. We do not care about the red. So this eight here for resolve and eight here for resolve doesn't help in this situation. 
ultimately we want kind of a balance uh social being the most important thing for a governor above their intelligence and above their diligence so i'm looking at ray arad or uluchi lei would both be the superior options it is kind of an even trade-off as i look at this i have a three plus 10 plus six would be a 19 total for her pertinent stats and for ray here I would get a seven plus nine is gonna drop us at 16, plus five is 21. So Ray is overall better statted, okay? What about specials up here though? Yeah, we have um, a couple of special options. Space Explorer, renowned Space Explorer who disappeared years ago only to reappear with no memory of what happened. Interesting. She may be happier on a ship, is what that may be telling us, than as a governor of a planet. She may not wanna be an administrator. Secondly, industrial, plus 10% pollution and manufacturing was assigned as governor. Interesting. Means you, your planet's dirtier, which is not good, but you get plus 10 production. So it's kind of like a lockstep. Again, it's trade-off, good and bad at the same time. And finally, right here, missing twin. Had an identical twin that went missing years ago. Oh, really? Oh, that's an that's a fascinating one. I don't know if those two are linked because you're essentially saying she disappeared years ago and she has a twin that went missing. <laughs> me doth smell a soap opera plot brewing. Um, <laughs> tell you what I don't like about Uluchi here, though. That 40 on loyalty, that is low. And I'm looking over here at Ray. He's got a nice fat 63. This guy's ready to rock. Before we choose him, though, let's just look real quick over to Var here and just double check. He's an opportunist. And, and yeah, okay. I want Ray. I'm just simply going to double click Ray, click, click. He's now ours. You can see it deducted his value from our piggy bank. We're going to jump over to governors and here is Kratos 4. So the system knows that it's a high level core quality world. And it's saying, do you want to assign a governor? And, and we'll just get more and more of these. Even I think you could see 10 on the screen and then it gets a scroll bar. So you can go to 15 to 20 to more become a lot to handle. But yeah, let's do it. So it's real simple. I just grab Ray and drop him in. Done. And you can see he is now the governor of the class 25 Kratos 4. Uh, real quickly, we'll just look over this there. His, his research is offering a plus 10% based off of his intelligence. Uh, gross income is coming at 18%, which is simply twice as social. Approval on the planet. This is pop approval. Happiness of the citizens is at 9%, again, based off of his nine of social. It's one to one. And influence growth, 4.5. That's one half of the nine. So you can see why I say social is the most important because it hits three of the categories. So, and then finally, we do have the plus 14% to manufacturing. That is simply twice diligence, two times seven. There you go. So diligence matters a little, intelligence matters a little, but social is king of governorship. So we'll hit done. Now, ta-da, double click on Kratos. Well, first of all, notice that when I select Kratos, which I just clicked it once, there is no dotted line. It no longer is feeding back to Earth. Now, Kratos 4 was a really good planet. We could have sent all the inputs here from Kratos 4 and pushed all those onwards to Earth, really helping Earth grow faster. But it would mean that Kratos 4 was fallow. It wouldn't be developing itself. And I want to do that. I want to develop it. Furthermore, I think that we can develop Kratos 4 extremely fast by feeding in Kratos 3's inputs as well as Kratos 2's inputs. That's right. Even though Kratos 2 is good enough to convert from an amazing colony to a core world by assigning its own governor, and we may do that eventually, I wouldn't rush to do that. I would take those fat resources from Kratos 2 and dump them right down onto Kratos 4 and help it grow real fast. And then once it gets big enough that it can stand on its own two feet with its good production base, then I could see potentially advancing Kratos 2. Okay, now, one other thing to consider, even though it's still early in the game, you can see that these Xeno over here, the Torians, uh, I think they're kind of always green for their, tor their tortleness. Um, they can probably see Kratos 2, or they'll see it soon. Even if, you know, maybe they haven't found it yet. But once they know it's there, they will send a colony ship. They're going to be like, yeah, we want to colonize that. We don't want them to do that. So <laughs> I really need another colony ship fast. And I need to get it over from Earth to here. So let's jump in 
We have a colony ship in production. Perfect. It'll be done next turn. That is all I ever wanted. We're going to send that immediately for this planet. I think we had been looking at like eyeballing it, maybe colonizing Mars here, which was an option. Sure. But this is just a superior product. And, and, and they will, the Xenos will go for it fast. Okay. So we got to get it fast. And are we done? No, we're not quite done because we want to jump into Kratos 4 by double clicking. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> I'm very excited. Let's just look at our new world here. Holy crap. They are very unhappy. Approval is dangerously low, which is reducing the colony's efficiency and making the colony vulnerable to foreign influence. Whew. Now, the good news is foreign influence, I think, comes into play primarily only when a colored influence bubble, that hex hexagonal grid from a Xenos world, overlaps your planet, surrounds it, engulfs it, or touches it. Right now, we are the only influence acting upon Kratos 4. So I don't think the low approval can cause it to flip. But it is a problem because if we come down to our manufacturing, you can see that our approval of times 25.5% is is really bad. That should be like times 90%, times 95%. That's, a, that's an on top of everything. It's essentially saying our total manufacturing is 16.12, but our actual output is 14.11. Why is that? Because one quarter of 16 is four. That's how bad that's hurting us, that low approval. And research, same thing. The approval there sitting at times 25, you can see our Tech input is at a plus four, but we're barely getting above a one in research output. So the inputs coming in are getting squashed down by people essentially hating on old Ray here. I blame Ray. Um, no, just kidding. It's probably not Ray's fault. What's our breakdown here? Why is everyone so unhappy? Why aren't you showing me a breakdown on the people? What's going on? I got one guy. One guy. And his approval is 25%. Interesting. He likes the minister. He likes the governor. Who's the minister? Oh, D.L. Bradley's the minister. The, the president of the parents. Okay. He likes that he's with, that he's the only human. I'm sure. Okay, there's no other <laughs> species. He's like, yeah, I really, I really like that. So it's, it's a world of one. What he doesn't like is his expectations are too damn high. Uh, taxes are too damn high at a minus 7%. This is a nice planet, plus 5. We are at our population capacity, minus 5. We can fix that right away. We'll get to that. We are unprotected. He would like a warship in orbit. Okay. And this world is polluted. Yeah, it is. It is polluted. And that has to do with the, the fact that um, there was archaic Promethean structures on this planet remember that reduced the atmosphere down and so it comes with a lot of pollution right out of the bag because it was processed heavily by the xenos that the, the precursor xenos of, of the sector of the galaxy so it's dirty and he doesn't like that quite a bit and finally our governor's loyal that's right because we chose a governor ray who's at 53 percent. remember he was at 63 and he dropped by 10 he does not like being a governor ray does unfortunately but 53 is not the danger zone, so we're fine. But yeah, he likes that the governor is not pissy. If he's disloyal, make him unhappy. So that's one of the rare cases. Now, as you gain more and more pops, the loyalty of each individual, the approval of each individual pop kind of gets washed out and evens out. But yeah, for right now, it's just one dude. He ain't, he ain't having it. So what are we going to do about it? There's so much to do here, folks. Um, in general, it's a good world. Listen, crime is quite low. Pollution is quite high. Uh, planetary defense doesn't matter yet. No one's going to invade us yet. That'll grow over time as we add pops. But yeah. I see the next citizen's not going to grow for 43 months. A big part of that is that because this is a Promethean refinery world, we have a massive hit to our fertility. It's suffering a minus 50%. It's halved. We have a single human adding a one hole per fertility. We're a fertile people, so we get a plus 25 to that, probably pushing us to 1.25. But we're suffering a minus 40% from pollution as well as a minus 50 because it's a Promethean refinery world. It was It's, a, it's an ancient factory world for a total of negative 90%. That's a massive hit. 
And so you can see here that, yeah, it's saying it's going to be it's going to be years before we get another population. That stinks. OK. Let's have a little fun and look over this whole world. This is one of the parts of the game I really enjoy is getting a brand new core world and just getting to look over it. So let's just take a moment here. Uh, let's look at our special specials. We've got the Promethean Refinery. So this ancient Promethean Refinery is still in working order. It is already generating one tenth of a Promethean per turn. We don't have to do anything. I don't even think it requires upkeep. I think it's just ours. That's a huge benefit, folks. And if you look up here, right at the top, this was not here before. Promethean, we have in our stores 0 0.1 of a hole. And every turn, we'll get another tenth. So every 10 turns, we get a whole Promethean. That's really nice. Nothing required, nothing wrong with that. Promethean is a requirement for many advanced planetary improvements thanks to its bizarre quantum nature existing in multiple realities at the same time. Promethean is a necessary ingredient for any well-equipped lab. So it's eh, tightly related to sciencey crap. Sure. Um, and is there any other improvement? No, there's nothing else we can do with that. It just it just is what it is. Okay, we also have a snuggler, snuggler colony. Thank you. Yes, I like that. So it's not doing anything right now, but you can see the little up arrow. That tells us that we can upgrade. So if I click it, we could build a snuggler shelter. And what that would give us is these furry creatures are the dream pet for all children in the galaxy. So for a minus 90 construction, we will get a snuggler, snuggler colony, which will generate one tenth of a snuggler, a whole snuggler per, <laughs> per <laughs> turn and plus two influence growth to the planet. So it's just like the it's like having a Coca-Cola factory or something like that in your it's, it's like the Heinz ketchup bottling factory is in your town and people come from all over the county and the tri-state area to see your ketchup factory. It's pretty sweet. And uh, the adjacency level bonuses here are plus two to approval or to plus one to wealth structure structures around the snuggler colony. So we're not going to develop that just yet. We don't see these snugglers quite yet. But let's look at our other second tier options. We have Thriving Reef, plus three research. We have a Underground Relics, plus three to wealth. We have a Floating Mountain. These mountains are beautiful and bizarre, plus three to influence. That is a little bit rare. Uh, you don't get a lot of plus three influence hexes. So that's a, a really nice one, actually. And then finally up here, we have a Geothermal Springs plus three to manufacturing. Those are all cool. And then beyond that, we've just got some research bulb, wealth, manufacturing, influence, influence. We do a lot with influence on this world. That leaf right there is a tropical grassland. That's not food. It is relating to manufacturing, as will this one be. Uh... Plus one population on the grassland there and a couple more manufacturing. So yeah, pretty straightforward. And then any, these are plains, desert, wasteland is bad for research. Uh, lagoon is plus one to approval. That's nice. So you notice here, this is, I only point this out because the lagoon has no icon. Yet it does offer plus one to approval. So that's why it's worth checking over every hex. Even if it, you think you recognize it or you think it. It doesn't mean anything. It, in this case, it does. Cool. And plus one to approval. Huh. Minus one to manufacturing. Rolling Highlands. Okay. So if you recall, when we colonized, we made that choice to get us the plus one to a tile, to, to, to an improvement level. I don't know what that got us. I don't. It might have gotten us one of these little bonus, you know, good ones. Uh, we have four total. It might have gotten us one of these standard, or it might have been these two lagoons, or one of the lagoons. I don't know. It's a little bit of a bummer that making the choice we did is never made apparent to what the outcome was, like what we actually got for it. Um, eh, what are you going to do? But in general, it's a pretty cool world. I'm satisfied with it. Now, you'll notice right off the bat, any new core colony, you get the core world capital. It's a population improvement. So we're going to want to drop this on a population tile. It costs nothing. You just get it for free. You get to place it and benefit from it immediately. So always make sure as soon as you assign a governor to core world, you jump in here and you take care of this. Don't ever advance turns and forget about it. You got to get right on it. Because it's going to give us a plus one to food. It's going to give, it's going to give us, it's going to cost us plus five to maintenance. 
massive tax hit. And that might come right off of our fat plus 10 here. Yeah, it's going to hit us right away. But the other things we get, plus two crime. I, <laughs> okay. Corruption with our politicians, I, I guess. Uh, it's not that great. Uh, plus one to manufacturing, plus one to pop cap. That plus one to pop cap will make this a one slash two and should help alleviate um, Dane's, Day Onem's unhappiness about being at our population capacity. Which could make this his 25 jump to a 20 uh, to a 30 or a 31 right away, it, right here, boosting that up, which would then lead to better manufacturing and better research output. We're gonna want to do it. What else does it do? The bonus per level, gross income plus five percent and a pop cap of plus one. That's per level. So if we take the core world. Uh, and then the final thing, adjacency level bonus, it's a plus one level to all hexes around it of anything you build there. So that's really good. So let's talk about a little bit of strategy here. If I grab the building, you can see immediately the only plus one, the golden one is right here. That is our only population tile. <sighs> this is a hard decision. If I drop this right there, it will make this a core capital world, the level one. I'm pointing, but right straight up in the upper right-hand corner, you see the little blue up arrow towards the line with the number one. That would mean that this building will give us the level one. So we'll get a 5% bonus to our income and a plus one to our pop cap right away. However, if I place it here, you'll notice now that over, yeah, up there in the corner again, it's now at a level zero. And you'll notice that for right there, we now get 0% gross income and zero pop cap improvement. And you go, well, gee, that's not a hard decision. Put it on, put it here, get that plus one. Huh. One last thing to consider. Adjacency level bonus is a plus one to all. However, this hex only neighbors this hex. That means this will essentially become a nice plus two to research or, or plus one to all others. But the rest is just is ocean, essentially. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, ocean, we'll say. However, if I were to plop this sucker right here, then all these tiles around here become a plus one to all. That's pretty good. That's, that's really good. So it's a tough decision, folks. It's a real tough decision. Mm. I've got an idea, though. I think that um, I would ultimately like this to be an influence world. So to, ma to maximize that, I think we should put it here because it'll give the plus one to this influence, to this influence, and to this influence. And... Not only do we have quite a few influence tiles, but that snug snuggler colony, when we develop it, I believe it gives, gives a nice fat plus two to the influence of the whole colony. So there's a lot we could do to make this very influential world. So yeah, let's drop it in there. You notice we get it immediately. You notice up here, our credits drop from the green plus 10 to green plus five, as we knew it would due to the five maintenance. Fine. We noticed that our pop cap jumped from not only a one to a two, but a two to a three. Again, because we get the pop cap under base effect of plus one, but an additional plus one because of the level. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. And then, yeah, now this influence here won't be just a plus three. It'll be a plus four. This influence won't just be a plus one. It'll be a plus two and a plus two. This manufacturing will be a plus two. And whatever we build here will be a general plus one. So that, yeah, 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 you guys get it. You guys get it. And then as we're, I just want to click on the snuggler, snuggler colony again. What were we saying? What does it get us? The shelter. Yeah, when we eventually build the snuggler shelter, a little ways down the road, we'll get that plus two to influence growth here. So we're going to do it. We're going to do a lot with influence on this world, I think. That being said, we need to start improving tiles. We have some buildings we could build, but oftentimes the buildings feed upon... The, the hexes you've developed. Um, in this case, like the planetary generator does give you a flat one to manufacturing. Well, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Industrial center gives us pollution and maintenance. That's nice. <laughs> it's not. Um, 
Here's what we need. We need production. We need manufacturing to build more quickly, to build more quicker. I, I think we can all agree on that. So I could build here for a two. And you'll notice when I click on this, it has popped up this sub menu here. It is showing that we can build agricultural, entertainment, finance, housing, manufacturing, and research, but only the manufacturing has a golden two. Cool. That means it's a good place to build the manufacturing without a doubt. That's the best thing to build there. However, let's click up here on our hot springs. Boom. There's a plus three and nothing else. <laughs> it's not good for anything else. So we're going to start manufacturing right there. Then when that's done, we will jump to this tile and it is now a three. Remember it was a two just a moment ago. What it is doing is it's, looking at what's in the build queue down over here and saying that I was a two, but once you've built, once you've improved the hot springs, I will now become a, a three. So I'm going to build that one. And if we, if we jump back to the hot springs, we'll notice that right down here, when you build the manufacturing distance, a, a district, it causes an adjacency level bonus of plus one to manufacturing to all adjacent hexes. So by building this guy first, not only is it the best way we can do manufacturing on, on the first build, but it'll then immediately cause this manufacturing district to be better as well. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. That's probably enough for now. We'll just leave those two in there. We'll see what else happens. Actually, let's do one more thing. Let's build that shipyard. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll, it'll be a little bit till we get it done, but ultimately what it'll do is that'll give us another platform from which to build spaceships. We have our forge here. This will just be a shipyard of Kratos in orbit around Kratos. So for every core world you have, you can have a shipyard. So if you definitely plan on playing a military style game or you just want to have a lot of probes and constructors and you, you, want, you, want, to, you want to have a space fleet, you need to have multiple core worlds. You really do. There's no way a single shipyard can meet all of your ship production needs. It's just, it's just not going to cut it. So yeah, you're going to want to get up to four shipyards, eight shipyards, 20 shipyards. And keep them all building all the time. Now, something that may not be obvious is that for the most part, whatever your core world's production is, is going to be what your shipyard's production is. They don't share. It wasn't apparent to me when I first started playing the game. If I started building a ship up at the shipyard, if it would bleed production away from the, the planet it was in orbit of, it doesn't. So if we get Earth's production to 20, the shipyard's production will also be 20. And they do not share. Nary do they share, which is nice. And in fact, if I double click into Earth, this military, that little red ship symbol there, that maroon, you know, was it maroon or whatever it is? Yeah, it's like incarnadine. Oh, there's a word for you kids. Brick red, incarnadine. <laughs> uh, the incarnadine symbol right here <laughs> is your military production. It sits at 4.6. Where is that coming from? <gasps> because our manufacturing is 4.6. Super simple. It's a one to one. I only point it out because there are a few buildings and things you can do over the course of developing your civilization that will improve your military production without improving your manufacturing production on the world. Meaning that this number will go up more quickly than this number. You could have a 20 manufacturing, but you could have a 24 to your military output because you've built some structures and some other benefits to, to beef that up. So that wasn't obvious to me, but it's an important thing for you folks to know. And as we find those buildings, we'll take a look at them and we'll get into that more. How are we doing on time? 48. Yeah, let's, uh, we'll do another 15 minutes or so here. I hope you guys are having a good time. Um, so listen, we got our colony ship coming up quick because we know we've got a really good, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm holding my mouse wheel down, by the way, if I want to rotate, get the angle and then just you know, left and right, we can flip the whole galaxy around. I try and return it to the original orientation as much as I can, just so I uh, have a geographical sense of my position in the galaxy. It's not a bad idea. Um, you can also, using the wheel, scroll in, and you can actually get some really nice, just beautiful views of the artwork. They've done a great job on that. I'm just scrolling in here. And look at, in, our, in the forge, that is a colony ship. Isn't that awesome? It's literally being built in there, which I think is a 
Nice touch, Stardock. Very, very nice touch. Um, but yeah, and you can zoom way, way, way out. That's the whole galaxy. That green dot there is our sector. So yeah, just have fun with it. Um, yeah, so quick thing, as I zoom out on the sector here, you'll notice that there are three colors on this arc. This is the control arc, influence arc, whatever you want to call it. Purple, which I believe is the your singularity, the uh, the robots. The blue, which is us, the Terrans, and the green, which is the Torian. And they are winning. <laughs> we know that because their section of the arc is largest. Their slice of the pie is the biggest. So yeah, we're in the middle. Listen, I'm glad the your singularity isn't above us because they can be quite belligerent. They're quite dangerous Xenos. And while we're talking about that, since we have met some Xenos, let's jump over to Diplomacy tab, tab is locked down here, right here, you guys. And you can see in blue, requires Universal Translator. Lovely touch again from Stardock. They're telling us why we can't get into that. Okay, so we can't do Diplomacy because we cannot speak. Is there another way we can see what the Xenos are doing? Let's come up here to the Summary option. We haven't looked at this yet. So the first one here is our advisors. We should consider colonizing Kratos too. We as well. The citizens on Kratos 4 are unhappy. No shit. And finally, <laughs> uh, God, who does this guy look like? The guy from Community. What's his name? You know who I'm talking about. The guy from Community. That's this is what he looks like. Uh, other civilizations should admire our culture. I, I agree. But we jump over to the summary tab. And what this is doing is saying, hey, this is actually kind of a nice little quick snapshot. We're getting our butts kicked by the Torians. Here we go. Core worlds, two. Colonies, zero. Population, 14. Civilization rank. We are ranked now by production, research, military might, influence, wealth or income, and approval. We are first in wealth and in approval. That's not bad. But we are woefully behind in manufacturing, research, military, and influence. Those are pretty big ones. Having happy people is nice, but it ain't going to win you the galaxy, if you know what I'm saying. So <laughs> we got a ways to go. You can see the balance of power graph. The Torians are sitting at a fat 44. And this is obviously some sort of amalgamation of their manufacturing, military, economic, blah, 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 everything. Just, I don't exactly know where that's coming from. We are sitting at a measly 14, just ahead of the ore at a 12. So it's bad. It's real bad. I've never looked too closely at these numbers, though. I find this interesting that our faction power is at a 14, and we show 14. The Yor is sitting at a 12, however, their composite number is sitting at 42. Because culture points are removed from 42, delete a 12. Question. Why don't the Yor benefit from culture points? We have zero culture points, and it makes sense that we add to 14 and we're at 14. And then finally, we look at the Torians. They're at 74. They have 60 culture points and they're at 44. I find that interesting because what it really means to me is that 60 is being divided in half into 30 for some reason. And that 30 is being subtracted from the 74 to give them 44. There's some numbers going on that I don't understand, but you guys, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye and see if we can ever determine what's going on. That's part of the fun of playing Galactic Civilizations 4, in my opinion, is that, it is, I've, I've talked about this before, is the fact that Stardock holds your hand on a lot of things, but on some things they hold back. They keep it a secret. There's a veil there. And I think it's a good mix. I think that they reveal enough to let you make informed decisions, but there are they're little mysteries, but it's not things that you can't figure out on your own if you read into it, if you look, learn, pay attention. So we'll see if we can crack that nut. But it's ultimately, we're seeing that um, a culture point of 30 will be deducted outright, but a culture point of 60 will not be deducted outright. It'll be reduced to 30 somehow. Hmm. Interesting. By the way, I can mouse over the Torians, although we can't co communicate with them. We see that they are fertile. They're unwavering. Their biology is aquatic. If you recall, we are carbon-based. 
they're carbon based as well, but they, they prefer ocean worlds is what that means. Civilization trait fast, they're explorers. Cultural collectivism is their focus. They have almost no prestige points. They have 10 of a thousand. Now, if you reach a thousand prestige points, you win the galaxy. You win the game. That's one way to win is do a pres prestige rush. And things that get prestige, um, completing missions. I'm sure conquering other colonies would get you prestige. I think maybe making galactic, uh, those galactic building improvements before anyone else and seizing those. It's think like civ civilization games, uh, like Civ Five, where you build the pyramids first and you get it, no one else does, and that adds to your prestige. So uh, you know, there's things that'll develop. Um, actually, can I mouse into that? No, it's not breaking it down for me. It's not telling me what else. You can see our relationships are cordial. It's sitting in the middle of this hot to green, sorry, red to green, stop to go. Stop is red, green is go. But you can see the double arrows means we're moving that direction. And ultimately, oh, if I mouse back over, that breakdown is sitting here. You're outside of our traveling range. So Essentially being, we just can't mix, so it, it gives a big plus three. It's like a plus plus and a three, and yeah. So they like the fact that we're not neighbors, and we probably like it too. What about the ore? Let's take a look at the ore. They're adaptable to run wavering. Interesting. Those are their abilities. Okay. They're synthetic. They're biology. Yeah, synthetic. That makes sense. They're robos. Their civilization traits are militant, brutal, and clever. The militant and brutal, it's not, it's not so great for us. Um, and clever is also not that great for us. But yeah, they are. And then their cultural focus is progressivism. Okay. Relations are already on the shitter with them. <laughs> so we get a single plus one because... Ah, hold and shift. We're outside the travel range. It gives us a plus one. They like that we, we can't touch. It helps our relations. But... Cultural differences, yeah, they're assholes, and we're nice, so that's a minus one. And then also, we're different kinds of life forms. Yeah, we are. They, they, they don't like the squishy bios. They don't like our carbon basedness. They like their syntheticness. Okay, sure. You're not a. Uh, you're not using those amino acids and uh, proteins to uh, build yourself. But uh, all right, it's fine. We won't hold it against you, unless we do. So that's it. And then of course for the Terrans. We're certain, we're fertile, wink, <laughs> carbon-based. And then, of course, we're clever, rich, productive, uh, shitty, passive, influential. We're unlikable, extremely so. Explorer, oh, God, did I do a crazy build on this? Did Oh, man, did I just go nuts on this? I did. Sorry, guys. We're bad liars, we're miners, we're bureaucrats, we're farmers, we're urbanites, we're meek, and we're unconvincing. We're terrible liars. Cultural focus for us is individualism. Individual, all right. We got an event popped up. Let's take a look. It's a situation report. Appoint a governor. We've identified it. This is a mission it's giving us. Unfortunately, we just assigned a governor last turn, and now it's saying go assign a governor. Well, we're going to need another core world to do that. So it's all right. We'll accept the mission. We don't really have a choice, and the mission will sit until we can assign a governor. So at some point, it'll benefit us. But... We've identified at least one planet we've colonized large enough to warn a governor. A governor turns any simple colony into a core world, allows us to build a shipyard and planetary improvements to increase the planet's output. A leader can be appointed as governor of any colonized planet with a, cla a planet class of 10 or greater. It's 10 hexes or more. The colonized planet will become a core world, which can be improved and expanded on to improve its contributions to the civilization greatly. A leader's traits and stats can have drastic effects on the world they're assigned to and its citizens. Some care should be taken in what leader is appointed as governor. Certainly. Appoint a governor to a planet either by selecting the planet or hitting the planet green gear management thing button through the leader menu. Okay, sure. Uh, we will find a leader and fill the position. And it started the mission there. And you can see here's the mission. Appoint a governor. You can read over. And this will just live here forever. I, I don't know if any of these missions have timetables, but at some point we'll get that. And, you know, completing missions, I think, gives you prestige. I, I don't know. 
I'm looking at our breakdown on prestige right now. Earn prestige by building your civilization, completing galactic challenges. The list, the below lists are the points you've earned from various aspects. Military faction, technology, manufacturing, economic, research rate, ascension, sector ownership score, population score, galactic challenges. Interesting. I don't know that these missions are galactic challenges. I don't know that missions give you anything. The, the appointed governor one is clearly meant to train you on how to play the game. It's just a reminder like, hey, you know, use core worlds. Simple. It's, but but like, for instance, way to communicate. Isn't it? It's a way to get extra technology quicker, but I guess it is a pretty critical part of the game. Maybe that's why it pops up. Because without the Universal Translator, you can't open the Diplomacy tab, or, or and you're missing out on a huge part of the game. So you really do need to get it. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if there's any additional benefits to completing missions. If anyone knows, I would actually appreciate if you made a comment saying what completing missions gets you outside of the basic description of the mission. All right, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it at that. Okay, so what else we got here? Um, Probably not a lot we can do. We'll just... Advance the turn. I'm waiting for this colony ship to complete over here. Remember? Here we go. We're boarding the TAS Colony Ship 1 from Earth. Um, Terran Alliance Ship. I, a TA? Terran Alliance Ship? Okay. So, does this matter? I can think of one thing. A couple things to think about. Approval. If we were to search through all of our population on earth these are the citizens of earth right now we could choose one that has low expectations if they're available which when they end up on the new world might make them considerably happier to be there so if i look at these real quick let's just check yara she's a criminal all right <laughs> helene is a nihilist fantastic ben's a totalitarian special Oh, expectations. Ah, there it is. Hold on, I was missing that. Let's go back. Expectations 20. Yara, expectations 20. I don't want to send her as a colonist. I don't think she'll like it. Here we go. Hel Helena. Helena. Expectation 3. That's good. That's low. And she's a nihilist. What the heck? She loves pain. Ben May is an incredibly entitled son of a bitch with expectation of 24. Bal is an 8. Visanti is a 9. Ma Mami Vim is a 14. She's kind of in the middle. Danielle Luck is a 4. and She's a traditionalist. I only bring that up because it's quite possible that you can promote traditionalism by the more traditionalist populations on a colony, the more likely a new colonist is to be developed it, it, to be born or grow that has the traditionalist alignment possibly that may be something worth exploring as we play through the game here is um as we have a dozen colonies 10 colonies we could theoretically take all the nihilists and put them on one colony and all the traditionalists on another and see if that greatly sways that i don't know i could see stardock having put something like that in there um, it, I mean, it would be really clever if you're like, I want more traditionalists in my empire. So every new colonist is going to be a traditionalist if I can help it. So they bring up that ideology. That would be very clever. Stardock, if you haven't done that, <laughs> eh, do it, please. That would be great. And then finally, here's our entertainer, Angie. She has very high expectations at 16. So yeah, I think we had an obvious pick here with... Uh, Hel How do you say it? Hel Helene Osh? Yeah. She's going. Why not? She's boarding up, but done. And you'll zoom in over here. There's our colony ship. Wonderful. And we already know the world we want to send it to. Um, I'm rushing over here because I just want to make sure we we, we beat uh, the Torians to this Kratos 2. And she's on her way. And it looks like it'll be one, two turns. So they'll get there pretty soon. And we know that we have a constructor coming very slowly at the forge. And we want that constructor as quick as we can because we know we want to get some Durantium deposits, the economic relic, potentially the AMAT. I would love to skirt over to that Prometheum and beat the Torians there, but that, that'd be a long shot. We'll see. 
All right. We have an event waiting for us. Oh, and we got a culture point. Let's jump to culture first. Here we go. So all this means is that we've accumulated finally eight culture points. We were earning about one per turn. This is probably the eighth turn of the game. Okay. So I'm seeing here that um, it's showing me this this sort of turquoise, what is it, Aquamarine 1, means we have one culture pick available in this tree. If you'll notice, none of the other culture trees have any picks available. Let's just jump down to pacifism real quick. Kindness takes 12 culture points. We have eight. The reason individualism, independence here, is at eight is because our ideology discount is at 28%. The 12 times 1.72 is eight apparently. Yeah, <laughs> maybe with a little bit of rounding, I don't know. So yeah, there we go. Independence, uh, we're gonna take it. Yeah, sure, Independ and, and we do that because we're individuals. We, we wanna go down the individuals and trees as humans, that's fine. Independence in colonies nurtures self-reliance, empowers them to tend to their own needs and flourish autonomously. Am I saying uh, autonomously? Yes. I was going to say autonomously. That's, that's not how you say that word. 50% decrease to supply attrition from colonies spawns the ship, the independence. So we're going to get a, a free ship. It'd probably be pretty cool. I'm happy about that. It may even be a flagship that we could send out. Think flagship, think Enterprise, think the Battlestar Galactic. It's the cool ships from your science fiction favorite shows that go and do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Serenity from Flower Firefly. They're having the most fun in the galaxy. Yeah, these are the ships that do the cool shit. So we want that. Now, the 15% decrease in supply attrition, what that means is, is we've seen the dotted lines between planets, star bases, resources feeding into, you know, everything feeds into the, the nearest local colony or core world but the further away those resources are traveling across space like literally the distance the number of hexes the greater percentage hit to to decay to um attrition they call it attrition it's think it's decay um loss corruption however you want to look at it and it can go very high. It can go well above 50%. It can go to 90%. If you if you built a colony freaking all the way across the sector and all those minerals are coming back to Earth, we could have massive losses. Okay. What this is saying is because in our individualistic society, every colony wants to be self-reliant. They are much less efficient. It's sending their supplies to a centralized government. They don't want their resources going to another colony. So it, it means that if we're going to play an individualistic build, we want to have more core worlds and less colonies because those colonies will never feed to the core world as efficiently. 15% is a pretty big hit. It's, it's about one sixth of, of a whole. So yeah, it's a, it's a big, it's a big tax. It's a big loss. Consider any detriment attacks. It's, it's a tax on your civilization functionally, a debit on your civilization's operation. But we're going to go down this route because this is what being a human's about. And it'll unlock all these other cool ones. I'm not going to show them to you now. We'll, we'll get to see them as we go. FYI, every cultural tree does in fact have nine. The, the five and the nine. Some of them, it's reversed though, these doubles here. Some of them go the other way. You can see here the four at the beginning, the five at the end. It's just, you know, th those are the two shapes you'll see. It doesn't really matter. So... We're going to collect this. Boom. Send cultural points to unlock independence. Yes. Done. You'll notice now it is unlocked the next two down the tree just because of proximity on the tree. And you'll notice though that the cost is 18 culture points and 18 culture point. So we went from an 8 to an 18. Wow, that was more than double. That's, that's a big growth. That's a big growth curve beyond exponential. So we'll pay attention to how that develops over time. But I'm not going to ruin those. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to spoil them yet until it's time to make a decision. You notice up here our cultural points switched to zero. We got 28 turns till we get the next one of these. And if actually I jump out to totalitarianism, that's up to 26. Wow. 
Let's jump back to individualism. 18. So what that means is, even though this is the, these two are the second tier on the tree, it doesn't matter. How far they are into the tree does not matter. Every time you pick a cultural circle option from any tree, it pushes all the cost of all of them up. So really what you're paying for is each incremental culture pick hits the target for your next pick. Irrespective of which tree you pick from or how deep into the tree it is. That's what I'm saying. So we jump down to totalitarianism and ultimately we're at 26 for anything else. Jump down to progressivism. They're at 24 because we're at a 4% pacifism. 26, collectivism. 26, yeah. Only through individualism are we getting that discount of 28% causing it to be 18. So you can see that overall plowing through the individualism culture tree will always cost us a lot less culture points than diverging into other culture trees. Done. And we got a technology completed. Now, this is a little bit tricky. Xenobiology. Oh, it's not tricky. I was just going to say Universal Translator is over here, FYI, right here. You would not want to select that as your focus for research because remember, we're paying a private corporation through that mission to develop it for us. So it can screw you up sometimes. The game can give you options to like be very inefficient. So be cautious. But no, we want to go for one of these two. So xenobiology could get us to a colonial clinic, planetary conversion, housing upgrade, agricultural upgrade, meaning a farming upgrade to all of our farming hexes. Awesome. That's not bad. And then, of course, the orbital manufacturing, the starport, mining missions, life support. Do I do I want the starport? What is the starport? That's just a it's a military improvement. Interesting. That's a building that would go on our colonies that would feed a lot of military production up to the to the shipyard. We don't need it yet. We're not locked in on production. Probably going to go with that xenobiology there then. Or 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 or, or wait 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 over here arm shuttles. Look at that arm shuttles is actually cheaper. It's not in our wheelhouse because we're not really military, but the thing I like about arm shuttles, if you read it right up at the top here, allows construction of armed spacecraft, meaning militarized spacecraft. Everything we put up there has been air quotes peaceful, but look at this, provides two free warships. Yeah, we complete arm shuttles and we just get two little frigate scout fighters, whatever, better than nothing. And they can be sent to explore, they can defend. We could take one of them and send it over to our unhappy guy who's so unhappy because he's unprotected. And that would probably give him that plus five or plus seven percent to his approval. Question? Yeah, let's do arm shuttles in four turns. Now you'll notice by adding in here arm shuttles, red options might we might start gaining special insights into red technologies as well. So I think that's the right choice for us. Let's hit done. And a couple of things to consider here real quickly. There's a lot of things to consider. We're getting late on the game here. <laughs> they are. Did we look at the research we just got? I don't think we did. Didn't it? It didn't pop up a uh, sidebar here, did it? I didn't see it. Okay. That's not great. But let's scroll in here. I want to look at I want to look at a couple of things. First of all, let's jump to Kratos. Why? Come on, come on, don't freeze up. Kratos. I wanted to look at approval. If you recall, our fella here, Day, is unhappy because he had a minus 5% because we were at the population max. That's gone here. It no longer lists that as one of his, his complaints. He was at a 26 approval. That minus 5% went away because the pop cap went up. And you can notice now his approval is sitting at a 30%. So that was immediately good. Other things we could do here is get him protection. Yeah, we want to get one of our warships in orbit of this planet. And that'll get rid of this minus 5% here. So just, just wanted to point that out, that that does work. Secondly, excitement. Here is our ship. Constable. 
what just happened? Whoa. What? I'm super confused. Bear with me. I want to try and break this down. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Galsiv does this a little bit. Um, the way events and things pop up, they feed you one thing at a time. They're saying this is happening. Here's a communication. Here's an anomaly. Here's a this. But correct me if I'm wrong. We never saw the research discovery thing pop up over here, right? But we just completed a research, a mystery research finished, and we aren't really sure what it was. However, did it have to do with research? Did it give us free research? Because you want to know what else just happened? We just chose arm shuttles and got it. Because I say that because if we look up here, we're now on subspace scanning, not arm shuttles. I also say that because we now have two arm shuttles, just awesome. <laughs> However, because I didn't understand the technology we were working on was going to give us a free technology, I should have chosen the most expensive research avenue. Instead, I chose the cheapest. And that sucks because that might, there were options on there that were over 12 turns. So I might have just wasted nearly a year's research because of that pick. Stardock, when you complete a research, you must pop up the you you must pop up the research thing over here. So so did I just finish research labs or quantum scientists whatever? Did did I? I don't know. You didn't tell me. But when it came up, I should have been able to read through it, and then it would have said you have now unlocked the next research for free, which then would have told me to carefully choose my next research. And that's a hard thing to remember after the fact because it's happened to you three times. You've been playing the game for fucking three months and you're like, oh, fudge. That's right. That shouldn't happen to us as the player. You should be like, hey, you completed this research. One of your rewards is your next research is free. Which one do you want to choose for free? You, you didn't do that. You, you just, nor we, so we've researched assault shuttles now and you also did pop that up. What? Fix it. That that is a problem. You've skipped two researches. We've got them. You just didn't. You didn't tell us. That's really really poor. Like like hurts gameplay poor. So please, Stardock, if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, let me jump up here to the monthly news report in the upper right corner. I should complete the point. It, 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 it's not even showing up in the monthly report. Like, it's not, it's not even telling us that this stuff has happened. Let me jump back into subspace scanning here. Yeah, assault shuttles are gone. We, we got it. Let's jump into the technology library, which is behind my face. It's, it's one of the buttons behind my face box. I'm just going to hit technology library. Let's sort by planets here. Research districts. I'm just reading through carefully here. Just bear with me, folks. Allows us to improve research districts. Okay. That's not telling us that we get a free research. Allows more people in the world. Okay. I'm not seeing any of the rest of these completed. So let's go to the next tab. I'm trying to f find out so we can understand this. Okay. We got that. Starbase is completed. Awesome. Starbase does not give us any research things, and there's no other completed technologies. Okay, let's go to Warfare. Okay, here's the armed shuttles that was going to take four turns that we instantly got. We got the two warships, and it's done. Let, let's read it real quick, because I, I keep telling you guys I'm going to read all these. So, real quick. We got lasers. Um, this is the type of weapon that can now go on our ships. There's a ship designer feature we'll get into, and lasers would be something we could drop into them. They have a mass and manufacturing cost, and their beam attack is at a plus two. We have a hypersonic missile. It's a little, little bit different here. Um, mass, manufacturing, kinetic attack. High damage with the high manufacturing cost. Interesting. We got the star cannon. Oh, oh. 
Star Cannon. Combine high damage with high manufacturing cost. Oh no, that's... That is that one, the 491. Let's get Hypersonic Missile. There we go. A slightly weaker in battle, but can be used to attack enemy fleets at range. So the missiles fire sooner from greater distance. So you short range, medium range, long range weapons, and then of course the damage scales with those, and then of course the manufacturing cost. We got the shipyard stimulus policy. We must subsidize our shipyards with more manufacturing help. This would be a policy we choose, and it will yield a minus 5% to all to gross income for the civilization, but we'll give up 20% bonus to the manufacturing of ships in the shipyard. Okay, cool. And it led to some other cool stuff. Awesome. Still hasn't explained why we got it instantly for free. Okay, let's jump to governance text. We have one done. And that was the one we started. That, that's the first one we did was governance. Allows research of communications technology. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm extremely frustrated because I don't know what ha I have no idea what happened. Does anyone else know? That's weird. None of these technologies say it just gives you free technology picks. Okay. What did we complete? Planetology? No, we did, we'd already read that one. Did we complete research districts? We did. Here we go. Let's hold shift. We'll wrap up here. But let's, I, again, I want to stay on top of the researches. I believe we completed research districts and then we completed armed shuttles. We already read armed shuttles. Let's read research districts. Technological capital, a unique improvement. So this is a civilization improvement. You can only have one in your civilization, but every civilization can have one. It's expensive. It takes three Promethean for the lab. Maintenance is one on tax, but it's a plus 20% to research, plus 10% to influence, probably just on that planet. I don't think that's civilization-wide. And finally, um, it's bonus per level is a plus 3% research, and it provides a three plus three level to all research around it. So again, it's it's worth noting that you, you can't build this on every colony. The technological capital only exists in one, one colony in your whole civilization. But you would want to build research labs all around it for that plus three. It's pretty beefy. Okay, what else do we got? Upgrade research. Increase the level of our research districts. Yeah, that's the hex. Improving all the research hexes by one level. Orbital research lab? Sure. Uh, this would be an improvement we would put on one of the um, satellites around one of our colonies. We could put a research lab. It would just give us a plus one technology uh, input? input onto that colony. And it would cost one Durantium one time to build and 100 Treasury one time to build. So no taxes on that. But yeah, that would be a nice way to boost, get a little technology squeezed on there. And we have the research grant policy. Education is the torch that will lead us to the next stage and resolve the problems we find there. So it's trade-off, plus 20% research civilization-wide, but gross income minus 10% civilization-wide. And it would unlock Xeno Research. So all that being said, we will, what do we want to work on next? And I know we need to wrap up here. This is a long one. Subspace scanning, get a lot of stuff. Eye of the Universe, Promethean Drives. Ship range, sensor range plus two. I like that. That would help us explore the sector of the galaxy much more quickly. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, let's do it. Let's take subspace scanning. We'll have it in four turns or we'll have it instantly for no reason. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Let's hit done. Okay. <laughs> ah, that was weird. That sucks because that added, it added so much time to our... our episode today and, and, and I'm confused it, it is please let me know anyone who's watching that knows the game did, did like did we do something wrong or did it just barf there that was just weird we got no research synopsis and then we got a free research instantly I, I don't I don't know what's happening okay. <laughs> we got another ship though the independence Cultural Unlock. She is a flagship. She's small. Frigate. 12 health. She's got a little bit of military. She's got a nice move of 9. Sensor range of 5. Um, yeah. She's a flagship. Ship known to seek freedom and adventure. The open expanse. This prototypes are unique. It's a one-time ship. But yeah. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to take her and immediately 
send her to go research this capsule. Yeah, there she goes. We'll start her on that. We're going to take one of our warships and we're going to park her on Earth to make those people happy. We're going to take our other research. These are just generic fighters. These are the free assault shells. And I'm going to send this one over to Kratos right now to help make that lonely, lonely boy happy over there. I'll forget otherwise. We play once a week here. So these episodes we do each week. An hour to an hour and a half, apparently. <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's it for, for this week, folks. Um, I hope you learned a lot. I feel like we got to a lot of good stuff. And aside, and, and then we have the deep mystery. What the heck's going on with, with the technology thing? Something weird happened. Maybe it it's in this event down here in the corner. There is an event pending. We'll get to it next time. Okay, if you watched... Thank you so much and take care.